Good afternoon. We had 14 new cases reported to us over the last 24 hours, which brings us to a total of 90 cases here in Hawaii that have been uh, uh, confirmed or are, are under our presumptive. Um, Ten of, of the cases today were residents, three were non-residents, and one is still under investigation. Let me emphasize, we're getting information out to you as quickly as we can, and, and in many cases, uh, we're still in the process of investigating uh, the cases, and, and uh, we'll have more information even as the day goes on. If you break down the cases by county, uh, 12 of those cases were here on Oahu. Uh, one was on the Big Island, one was on Maui, and we haven't had any cases reported from Hawaii uh, as, as, uh, today, uh, today, I should say. Um, we didn't uh, hear of any children or young uh, adults uh, infected. Uh, those that were 18 uh, include all the cases we have reported today. And incidentally, over the uh, last, uh, or since the outbreak has started, we've had only two pediatric cases. 88 cases were adults, that is over eight, 18 years old. We have, in today's group of uh, cases, the 14 in total, we had two individuals hospitalized, um, and we're still in investigating uh, a couple of those. And uh, perhaps of most interest, uh, all of those um, cases where we've been able to identify uh, a travel history were, were associated with travel or had been exposed to someone who was traveling. We're still investigating a number of, of, of um, others who, uh, um, for whom we have not had a chance to, uh, to find out what their travel history is. We are um, 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 in the process now of, of um, reevaluating uh, the uh, first fatality we had. We, we take this very seriously when we do have a, a report of any, anyone who uh, has uh, died as, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we are in the process now of, of reevaluating the, the test results there. But apparently were some procedural issues with regard to the, the test. Originally the test was done by a private laboratory and determined to be inconclusive and uh, we're wanting to run that uh, test again and uh, we should have um, uh, conclusive results on that before the end of today. Because of the importance of these, uh, any death associated with COVID-19, we, we have developed a policy as of late to uh, require retesting of any sample we've had. We want to be sure the results are, are accurate. So I'm, I'm providing the best information we have at this time, and uh, we will be um, in the process of reevaluating that uh, that one test result. Dr. Park, would you like to add anything to what I've described? Uh, so um, as regarding that death, it was reported to us uh, a couple of days after the death had occurred, and so um, we are following up um, with the healthcare uh, facility uh, providers, um, family on. Um, just uh, making sure that uh, they're aware that infection, um, regarding the infection control. So far, as we see it, um, the clinical management did not change, um, did not was not affected by whether or not it was COVID-19 or not. And I think that's an important uh, thing for everyone to um, rem remember is that you know this is a virus. Um, the the management, clinical management for someone with a viral infection is the same regardless of whether it's COVID-19 or not. It is to rest. It is supportive care. Um, and uh, it, uh, and you know and that means if, if you have mild illness, staying home, getting rest, getting lots of fluids, keeping your germs to yourself. If you have uh, more severe illness, seeking seeking that. Uh, so seeing that you you are here with us now is very important. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So um, at any rate, if you have severe illness, to. Um, mute or mute this thing like this. Excuse me, can you mute please? Thank you. So if you have severe illness to um, call your doctor, especially if you have underlying um, Ill, uh, conditions, uh, medical conditions, um, if you are an older person, these are the things that we all need to think about as a community uh, um, because those persons who are older have underlying illness, they are especially vulnerable um, not just to COVID-19, but frankly to flu, to so many other things. We need to protect the those people who are vulnerable in our community. So that's all I'd like to say. Let me, let me add one more thing. And as we investigated this, uh, this case, uh, we have identified contacts and pursued those just as we would with any other case. Uh, uh, we, we are aggressively looking at 
each and every case that's reported to us that's possibly COVID-19 related and uh, would be uh, identifying close contacts, following up with those close contacts and others as well to be sure that uh, um, they are uh, uh, in quarantine if they need to be and, and notified of their possible exposure to the case. I'm, I'm confident we're doing what we, what we can to, uh, to assure that that happens, irrespective of a final test result. Let's take our first question from BigIslandNow.com if you're on the line. Okay, how about MauiNow.com? Okay, let's go to Sherry Bracken at KWWX in Hilo. No question here. Okay, thanks, Sherry. Uh, next would be uh, Honolulu Magazine, Robbie. Robbie, are you there? Honolulu Thank Magazine. you. You said that. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, the first case. When the clinical, uh, when the private lab did it, it was inconclusive, and so your you reran the results, the state lab once yesterday and again today, and if I can clarify on that, and then what would you make of the discrepancy, and whether that would suggest underreporting or or what that might, or what we might take away from that? The discrepancy with regard to. Let, let me let me rephrase that. And first, like the case was inconclusive. Okay, so... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it highlights that this is not just a simple test. Um, it does require technical skill. It requires um, high-tech equipment. Um, and so there are going to be, with so many samples being run, there are going to be these few that sometimes give an, what we call an indeterminate result. Um, and it's so, it's so very important, especially when you have a fatality, to be absolutely sure of what's going on um, with that result. So. Um, as a protocol, we're, we're likely to rerun any specimens that are associated with a fatality just to be absolutely positive. Um, and it, especially if, if this is, uh, if we have something like this where we have an um, initial report from the clinical commercial lab as an indeterminate result. So that, that's, that's the process that we're following right now. And again, because we want to make sure that we are absolutely positive in terms of what the result may be. But again, uh, you know, in terms of the management of the patient, um, it didn't change anything about how that uh, that patient was managed. Um, we, it doesn't change anything regarding what we do. Um, when we're notified about a result, we make contact with healthcare providers, with members, uh, persons who may have been affected. We, we uh, are aggressively at this time pro uh, producing or, um, uh, or pursuing, I should say, um, contact tracing. Um, so that we make sure, as Dr. Anderson said, um, that make sure that um, any person who might have, might be at risk now um, is appropriately uh, advised and, and also kept separate from anyone else who might be at risk. Robbie, this is Bruce. Um, let me just uh, add to uh, what Dr. Park has said. We reported this case out last night, I think close to 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, immediately after we got the result. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a chance to today reevaluate the uh, the results, and we did find an irregularity in the processing of that sample. Um, uh, if we had waited longer, we probably would have seen that. But just to be sure that we got the right result, um, we do want to run the test again and make sure that this is in fact a, uh, a positive. Again, it would not have changed in regard to managing the case. The individual uh, died uh, two days ago. <laughs> Obviously, the results would have been uh, irrelevant as it related to his how that individual is handled. And I have to emphasize, too, that we, we have handled the case the same regardless of what, how this result came back. We have assumed that it was a positive, identified contacts, and uh, pursued that. Uh, so we'll know by uh, this evening whether or not that is, in fact, a positive. If it's a negative, of course, we'll let you know. Um, we want to be sure you, of course, have the correct information. So stay tuned on that, and, um, and we'll, we'll uh, of course, let you know one way or the other. But we do feel that any death, of course, associated with COVID is an important one. Mm -hmm. And by practice, uh, uh, we're going through this for the first time. <laughs> we are going to be testing uh, each and every individual who is t positive and if they've passed away, 
uh, test them um, again, the results, the sample again to make sure that we got the right result, mm -hmm. just just to be sure the reporting is uh, is accurate. Okay, our next question from Hawaii Tribune Herald. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, and I apologize. I, I don't know if this is something you, you guys may have addressed yesterday or not, um, but I was wondering if, if you think that the governor's actions go far enough to help, um, you know, flatten this, this curve, or if, if maybe these, these drastic actions have come too late, um, considering, you know, how, how rapidly the cases have been identified um, here in the state. Well, I'm going to start with the answer on, on that, if I could. Um, at this point in time, we don't have any evidence of community spread, that is widespread uh, community transmission. So I think we've gotten um, as far as we can um, uh, ahead of this, this whole process by imposing those uh, rather extreme uh, measures uh, requiring people to stay home. Um, and it's to prevent the, the disease from spreading in our community. The best time to do that is before it becomes widespread, where you can expect your prevention measures to, to make the most difference. So I, I believe uh, the governor and the mayors who have imposed these very stringent requirements are acting appropriately and, uh, and uh, certainly support everything that they're doing. Each county is different. They all have different issues. Um, and it's understandable that there would be different restrictions in different counties, but the the fact is that most of the um, counties are moving forward with, with restrictions consistent with what the governor's laid out. I expect we're going to see additional restrictions and, and controls proposed as, as time goes on, particularly if there are situations where people are not compliant with what the governor's main message was, which is stay at home, uh, don't spread the disease to others as best you can, you can avoid that, and, uh, and of course work at home if, where, that's, where that's necessary. So um, we, we, we do support 100% what's being done here in Hawaii. I think we're way ahead of most of the country in, in that regard, and we're certainly uh, on lockstep with what other uh, jurisdictions are doing now in trying to prevent the, uh, the spread of, of COVID-19. So far as we know, um, most of the cases, in fact, all of them that we've been able to document uh, have been associated with travelers or, or others, uh, and, and the few that we haven't been able to nail down um, may have been exposed to travelers. Um, so I think we're in a situation that uh, is ideal for implementing these measures. We certainly wouldn't want to go any longer before uh, uh, taking actions as we have. Well, I, I do want to add, there was at least one individual that we know did not was not associated with travel, and it just points to the fact that there is probably some amount of localized tran community transmission, and you know all this focus on what our leaders are doing to protect us. Um, I would actually argue that we, all of us in our community, have a responsibility to take responsibility ourselves for, for how to protect our community. So it's not just about waiting for our leaders to enact whatever laws or mandates or whatnot, but for all of us to think about how do we protect our, ourselves, our family, our community. And it is that simple um, message that we've been trying to uh, get everyone to understand, social distancing, keeping our distance from each other, keeping your germs to yourself, washing your hands, um, um, cleaning surfaces on a regular basis. These are all really important measures that can be done and should be done regardless of what our leaders are saying or doing. So I just, I just want to make sure everyone is an, um, understands that. Let, let me finally throw in one last bit. Uh, we haven't talked about that today. We have in the past, and that is our Sentinel s surveys. Um, uh, we're not only following cases that are reported, we're actually looking to see if there is uh, unreported illness occurring out, out in the community. Uh, we've collected a total of 200 and I think it's 60. 263 so 63 far. 63 samples so far and we're going to continue to test. Uh, the good news is we haven't seen any evidence of widespread community transmission based on that survey. That survey has been done statewide. We're looking at all age groups, uh, high risk as well as low risk individuals, individuals who have respiratory illness that could be COVID-19. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, comfortable or confident that we've, we haven't seen any evidence of widespread transmission. Having said that, it could be that there is some transmission occurring that we haven't been able to identify. And again, this is the time we want to act. This is the time when we want to, to be together as a community and preventing the spread of that disease. It's going to take each and every one of us to, to, to accomplish this 
um, regardless of what the mandates are. Uh, the Maui News, please. Maui News. Hi. Hi, yes, we um, we learned this morning that a, a Maui Health employee um, had tested positive for COVID-19. Um, do you know how the employee became exposed and are you able to see what facility it was at? I mean, nurses at these facilities so are worried and feel like they should know. Yeah, no, um, this, I would note this is not the first healthcare worker we've identified with COVID-19. Um, there have been others. We work immediately with the facility um, when we identify a healthcare worker. Um, we uh, meet, work with that person who is infected to make sure we're aware of all their work activities. Um, we again aggressively um, uh, pursue any contacts, close contacts um, of these individuals to make sure that they understand they're advised appropriately, they are aware, and that if they are truly pro um, uh, close contacts, having prolonged close contact with the individual that um, if they need to be in quarantine, they are in quarantine, that they are monitored um, in uh, collaboration with us and their facility. Um, so I guess what I would say also to the specific uh, um, co-workers of the, the individual that uh, we are working with the facility as well as the individual to make sure we identify all persons that um, uh, need to be notified and um, they are being notified. So if they are not notified, then they, they should just continue to practice appropriate infection control. Um, that is, if they have a patient that has respiratory symptoms, a cough um, or a sneeze, that they should make sure to put a mask on that person to protect others from that person, um, as well as if they have to treat that person, uh, wear the appropriate protective gear, which is a mask plus eye protection covering all their mucous membranes. So the, those are really important things to note, as well as, by the way, washing your hands. Um, so those, those are important for everyone to understand. Um, let me, um, healthcare workers are, are one of the high risk groups mm -hmm. across the country. In fact, there's a disproportionate number of healthcare workers who have been infected. Obviously, they're treating patients day in and day out and uh, potentially exposed. Uh, one of the reasons why we're very concerned about the availability of, of, of protective equipment is to be sure that our healthcare workforce is not exposed. And, uh, and in that regard, we need to be sure we're conserving uh, supplies and equipment to be sure that they do have the protection they need to continue to support support this uh, need. Uh, this is happening across the world, by the way. Uh, doctors, nurses, and others are, are of course, uh, coming down with COVID-19 in larger numbers than you would expect if you didn't uh, recognize the fact that they are our front line and they are uh, risking their, their, their lives every day to, to uh, come to work to, uh, to protect us all. Okay. Uh, Honolulu Civil Beat. Okay, so can't say what facility was at. No. Civil beat. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Eleni with Civil Beat. Um, with Queen's Medical or the Queen's Health System putting out a plea for donations for PPE, specific items did we request from the national stockpile and how much of each? And did we request any items that would increase testing capacity? So we requested, um, the items we requested from the Strategic National Stockpile are primarily to support our healthcare workers, our healthcare facilities, so that they can protect us and as well as protect themselves from infection. So in that uh, request did include the masks, specifically uh, regular medical masks as well as N95 masks. There were a number of other items that were also included. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not privy right now to the exact number. I'm sure we can get that data to you as far as what was received. I can tell you that a number of items were received. That the Healthcare Association of Hawaii um, is working to uh, with the healthcare facilities and other providers to make sure that there are um, those those needed, very much needed, precious. Um, equipment, personal pr protective equipment especially, are distributed to the facilities. But um, it, even though we've gotten that strategic national stockpile allocation, we need to keep in mind that um, there, these commodities are still very precious. We need to help our healthcare workers um, and our facilities to make sure that the, that we do not um, contribute to burning through um, all of those, all that needed uh, PPE or personal protective equipment. Um, they are the, they are who we're going to be relying on as this uh, pandemic continues to take care of all of us. By the way, just to let you know, I, I believe we, there were 11 pallets of, of, of 
of supplies and equipment that arrived and are now being distributed out to uh, all, all the counties and, and, of course, hospital medical facilities there. One of the uh, concerns we have is, is making sure that the private physicians also have uh, materials and, and supplies that they need to, to participate in uh, the prevention of this, this outbreak. Uh, and we're also wanting to be sure that they get what they need. Uh, all physicians are, are dealing with this issue, and, and they're the front lines for, uh, for protecting us and identifying cases. So um, it's not just the hospitals uh, and other medical facilities, long-term care facilities. It is also our private physicians who are uh, in, in need of these supplies, and we are aware of that and, and, uh, and doing our best to be sure that they also have uh, the supplies and equipment they need to, to continue to operate. Okay, next, Hawaii Public Radio. Hi, thanks. Um, so to go back, um, how many people are non, have non-determined coronavirus results that are hospitalized? As of now, do we have a number for that? And then if this person who passed away um, had some kind of underlying disease, why were they not um, immediately tested locally so that we could get a result within that quick four to six hour period? So and to answer the first question, a reminder that what's reportable to the health department are um, cases that are suspected to be potentially infected with COVID-19. Um, it is considered urgently notifiable, um, as well as now that we have the clinical labs up and running, if someone has actually tested positive, that we do require the laboratories, as well as the physicians and other healthcare providers to report those to us. So hence, if you think about that, we don't have visibility of every single person out there who's hospitalized um, uh, with an illness. We only have visibility of those who are reported to us who are either the clinician feels they suspect they have a person with COVID-19 infection, or who, um, who is positive. Now that said, um, our physicians and other providers are very busy, they're, they're put upon. Um, what we are noticing is frankly what we notice with every other reportable disease condition is that a lot of times we aren't notified until after the fact when, when they get a positive result. Right now, the labs are working very closely with us in that they're trying to make sure we're aware of a positive result as soon as the provider is. So we are actually um, getting that result and then having to then find out more information by um, and getting in contact with the provider and, and getting that information. Um, uh, forget the other one now. The, the well, while, you're, while you're thinking of it, let me, uh, mm -hmm. the, the numbers I have are that um, out of the 90 or cases that have been confirmed, six were hospitalized. Now, that's not, it's not clear whether they were, right. they weren't necessarily in the hospital for the whole time. I think those she's are, asking about just all hospitalized indeterminate you know, kind of results or something like that. Um, the other, I think the other, well, actually remind me what your other question was. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I got muted. Um, but my the other half of that question was if um, that person had some kind of underlying disease right. or, you know, they were at high risk and seemed, it right. sounds like they were very sick. Right. Wouldn't they have fit the criteria to be tested locally so yes. that we could have, they could have gotten a result within you know, like that four to six hour period? Yes. So what we're starting to see is, um, you know, we're seeing starting to see clinicians kind of revert to what's um, sort of normal practice. They have a patient that they're caring for, and they order the result and the res and the, the or or order the test. And the test is getting sent to a clinical lab, and that's what normally happens with every other disease. And that's what we're starting to see, and that's probably what happened in this case. Having said that, our labs are um, local labs are actually starting to stand up their own um, internal capacity, so that I think very very soon in the next week or so we're going to start to see that they can run these tests in-house, so to speak, in the state of Hawaii. And I can say, actually, for this particular, um, if you think about it, the person had um, their specimen taken um, on admission. They unfortunately passed away um, very quickly after that. We were apprised within two days, essentially, of, of um, or um, yeah, we were apprised of it within two days when the results came out, two days after the specimen was collected. Um, that's very fast. That should indicate to you that specimen was actually tested here in the state. So it's demonstrating to you that our clinical labs are slowly coming on board, um, which is a great, which is great news. It means that they are starting to not send specimens out to the mainland, um, and that is that is awesome news. Essentially, um, it really means that our capacity, testing capacity here in the state, to help out. 
clinical providers and their patients um, is, uh, you know, is, is, it's, it's going to be a reality very soon. But going back to, again, just a reminder that test result or not, whatever the test result is, it didn't, doesn't change the clinical management and didn't change the clinical management of the patient, especially underlined, underscored by the fact that the results on this test didn't come back for two, three days after um, the patient had already succumbed. Uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser. Star Advertiser. Hello. Okay, Hello. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Uh, this is Tim. Hi, Tim. I need, um, my question is: uh, Is the death counted among the ninety cases? And uh, what's up with the changing categories? It's some kind, sometimes confusing, and makes it seem like the numbers don't add up. Now, Tim, this is uh, Bruce. Um, Yes, we, we have uh, assumed that that uh, death was one of the cases. Again, that's being reevaluated at this time. But having said that, um, um, we are still working on our reporting uh, criteria. Some of the things that the counties asked for would be to uh, item, uh, designate uh, which of the individuals who was tested um, or found to be positive in their county was um, a resident and who was a visitor. Basically, that was a criteria that was asked yeah, for. That and actually hasn't happened yet, but um, the the, the um, reshaping of the table is really trying to provide you all more clarity, and not just you all, but really the public, um, clarity on what is going on in the state of Hawaii. Can I ask you specifically what is confusing to you? Um, the, uh, uh, let me see. The... Uh, numbers. I don't know where the table is now. I was looking at it. Um, some of them, you know, there's uh, cases on certain islands, and and uh, then you add new cases, and then they and they don't seem to add up. Okay. So one thing that you should know, and I think that there's a footnote that notes today that there was a noted that there was a du duplication of a case count yesterday. So the, if you added up the new cases, the 14 new cases to yesterday's case count, it'll, it will be off by one. So that's one, uh, but it should be in the footnote. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there was a, okay, I'm being reminded that, that this, there was a discrepancy in the way uh, was reported Kauai versus Hawaii. I think um, so there are, there were some things, but we're trying to make sure that the data is complete. Um, it, it, it's we're we're trying to report it because the counties are all interested in who you know who among their residents were um, reported as positive, um, you know because we all care about our ohanas right. So we're trying to present that data as well as presenting you know what who is a Hawaii resident versus not a Hawaii resident. Tomorrow I will tell you now there will be a new row added because um, we are being apprised um, of Hawaii residents. Um, who may, you know, this always happens with every uh, pandemic and, and this happens with every state um, in that, uh, or outbreak I should say, there's um, there are potential for residents, our residents to be somewhere else and diagnosed somewhere else so that we'll add a new row in anticipation of that happening as well. We'll, well, we haven't sent out today's report as far as I know. We'll, we'll double check the numbers uh, before we send something out. We, we wanted to be sure it was accurate and recognize there was some confusion there. So. Uh, uh, Dan Dennison and his team uh, here will be uh, double checking the numbers so at least they're they're accurate within the categories that may have been reestablished. And uh, we'll continue to work on a format that uh, is easy and understandable. Thank you for the feedback, though. Uh, Chelsea, Hawaii News Now. Hi, yes, just more clarification on the first reported fatality. So in the news release last night, it said that this person had been tested at a clinical commercial laboratory and the result was inconclusive. Mm -hmm. Then follow-up testing yesterday by the State Laboratories Division confirmed COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying that there's a inconclusiveness again. So why even send out a press release to begin with if you're not 100% sure this is creating mass confusion? Let, let me say, uh, you know, we we um, 
we do the best we can in getting information out. It, it, we're wanting to, to verify that result at this point in time. Um, and in the future, we are going to be double checking any results on any a deaths. Uh, that is making sure that uh, we're retesting those individuals just to be sure that the results are accurate. Um, in this case, we did uh, go back to re review the procedures and, and there were some uh, procedural issues that we wanted to be sure uh, did not impact the results, but um, um, I think I think I, you all I think we all recognize that in this current climate there is such heightened concern um, that any any um, word of death in any facility that might have a hint of COVID-19 will get out regardless of our releasing any information or not. And so our protocol is to evaluate any such serious concerning case very closely. Um, but we also have to balance that against informing the public. Um, and so that sometimes means informing you all before the evaluation is complete. Um, and so it's just today, it, you know, now it's daytime as opposed to in the middle of the night. Um, we can tell you that we are continuing our evaluation. And part of that evaluation is retesting the result and reviewing uh, um, how that first result was, uh, was reported out. Okay. PITV, please. TV. Okay, hearing nothing, KHON. Can you hear me? Yes, is it TV or KHON? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Rick. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, my question was about the total count. When you list somebody in the pending category, what exactly does that mean? Pending means that investigation is still ongoing and we do not have complete invest uh, investigation findings to be able to categorize um, appropriately in that whatever that category is. So if it's uh, if you're seeing a pending and it's in the sort of hospitalized row, it means we haven't been able to determine that whether the person is truly is, is hospitalized or is out at home. Uh, if you're seeing a pending with regard to a county of residence, it's because we haven't been able to determine a county of residence. And it's primarily, again, it's that trying to give you that information, give everyone that information as soon as we can get it out there. Um, but, you know, understanding that investigation is ongoing, there's a lot of pieces that still need to be um, fit into the puzzle. Um, and so that's why we have to, you know, obviously you do not want us reporting um, what we know and then not acknowledging that there are some unknowns out there because um, you, then you'll be asking us why the numbers don't add up. Let me, let me just add, when we, when we get a report um, from a private lab or anyone else, we get the name and very little other information. So our staff have to go out and, and contact the individual, identify what the travel history has been, of course uh, any contacts that they may have had. And that process can take days. Um, we report what we have when we have it. And uh, in many of these cases, uh, we continue to evaluate for, for an extended period of time. I think the staff do an exceptional job in, in, in trying to identify uh, the histories and potential contacts of those individuals as quickly as they possibly can. Obviously, we want to reach people as soon as possible and uh, inform them. So. Uh, you can expect that going forward, we will not have complete information on everyone. The alternative would be for us not to report anything for a week, and make sure we have all of our I's dotted, T's crossed, and have everything absolutely accurate. I, I that would, would be nice. <laughs> I would trust that you would want to see the information that we have when we have it. So again, I've said this before, I, 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 I hope that's what we're, we're reading your needs right, and we're trying to get out what we can as quickly as we can. Now we may have made uh, a mistake last night in sending a result out, but we, again, we wanted you to know what we knew, um, and I'll leave it at that. I think it's a reminder. This is not, uh, you know, I think we're all in the society conditioned to instant response, you know, click of a button, whatever. I think all of you have heard me say before, this is not a TV show. It's not over in half an hour. This is real life. It goes on for weeks and months. It takes time. Think about when you get a call from someone and if one of my investigators called you and said, can you sit down with me half an hour, go over line by line all the things you did for the last how many days, you know, before you got sick, can you tell me every single person you were, uh, you associated with? Um, I think you'd understand, I think it, hopefully that yeah, helps you understand 
um, the challenges that we face. Um, that said, the information we get, we are trying to get that out to um, folks as fast as we can, um, especially the information that's really important for the public to understand or for persons who might be uh, at risk to understand so that they can make sure to um, uh, protect themselves and our community. Uh, well, we can have I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. Yeah, please. Go ahead. So, so when you went ahead with the press release last night, shouldn't you gone on the side of safety and just not said it was a, it was a death because the evidence was still inconclusive? Well, let me say very clearly, there was a death, and that individual uh, yes, was tested but for the COVID, cause COVID nineteen, and we we. Um, our, our preliminary results at least showed that that was positive uh, and and we went, went forward with that. We are reconfirming that. Um, that is a retesting uh, sample uh, and we should have some, some conclusive results uh, by the end of today. Okay. Anyone on okay. the call that we missed? Okay. 